last week when I was speaking, I had mentioned something that I thought was very powerful. Uh, that when people come to situations and problems and issues in their life and I begin to counsel them, I'll simply ask this question, well, have you prayed about it? And what I usually get is, Pastor, I'm praying all the time. But I will respond back, it's not what you're saying to God that's going to make a difference in your situation, but what He's speaking to you. Amen. And so I want to speak from this place of how to hear from God and, and also how to distinguish or how to discern, is that God's voice or maybe that's a burrito? Like, like is, is God speaking to me? And it got me to thinking, uh, there was this story that I was reading as I was studying for this sermon about ice houses. Do you, you know, anybody know what an ice house is? My baby boomer generation out there? Yeah. And so ice houses, uh, they, they would usually store up the ice. They'd get it from the mountain or get it from the winter season and store it in these places to, to keep over the spring and the summer. And you put it in your ice box. That's a refrigerator for us younger people. And it would keep your stuff cold. Some of y'all looking like, you don't even know what it is. I watch Frozen. Leave me alone. <laughs> so, so in one of these, these ice houses, they were, they were storing up the ice and they would cover it with sawdust. Well, this person, this employee that was storing up the ice, he had lost his valuable watch in the ice house. They were trying to search for it. They couldn't find it. It was like a needle in the haystack. And this young boy said, Look, hey, I, I, I'm sure I can, find the, I, can, I, I can find that watch. And he said, get everybody out and just shut the doors and let me sit here for a minute. And as he sat there, he just listened in the quiet for the tick of the watch. And he was able to find the watch easily. You see, here's the thing. When you put yourself in position, when you get still before the Lord, you can hear the tick of heaven. You can hear and be in synchronization with what God is speaking. But it takes a heart that's willing to get out of the distractions, the busyness, the, the worries of life in our day. And, oh man, I, I got to get, get to the store and get my milk. I got I to get, get through what I'm doing. And, and, and when you have that attitude of the busyness and, and the bustle of, of your day, you'll miss the intricacies. You'll miss the intimate moments. You'll miss when God's, you're at Walmart and you're like, well, I just got to get my groceries and get out. And God's like, I want you to pay for those groceries in front of you. And you miss that because you're so consumed with yourself. You're so consumed with the cell phone bill that you can't hear what heaven is speaking in that moment. And it takes a heart that's willing to be humble and hungry before the Lord. And see, it's in that place, it's, it's when you understand that, that you're able to hear from heaven. I think of a, a, a movie, I don't know if you've ever seen this, it's Ratatouille. It's about a rat that's a cook. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe not. And anyway, it's a rat that's a cook, and he's got he's got a lot of uh, gifts. And his, his his gift is this that he's able to eat food and taste food, and it takes him to another place. He, he he's able to just from a little cheese, he goes to these special uh, far out places and can taste the intricacies and the delicacies, and he even knows that he can mix them together, grapes and cheese, and it's just a blessing and smorgasbord in his mouth. Yet his brothers, the ones that are even even born of his own DNA, they're okay with just the trash. They can eat whatever. They just want to get their stomachs full. And here's the beautiful thing. You got, you got a little bit bigger gift than the ratatouille thing. You got the Holy Spirit inside of you. That when you accept Jesus, you get this gift. You get this awesome privilege of being a child of God. And being a child of God allows you to hear your Father's voice. Allows you to hear him above the rustle and the bustle of your day. Like, like you can hear what he is saying to you. Jesus speaks of this in John the 10th chapter. I, I Y'all okay? Yeah. Too many parables in the beginning. Should have just went straight at it. In John the 10th chapter, I love this with the first verse. He says this, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door. And he'll explain the door. It's real simple. It's him. Jesus is the door. Everybody's like, I need an open door. I need favor. You just need to be like Jesus and you're in the door. That's a bigger amen I need out of you people of God. But climbs up some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. Isn't that amazing you're called by name by God? Come on, somebody's got to say amen out there. And leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep 
follow him, for they know his voice. Look at your neighbor and say, I know God's voice. My friends, it's, it is that simple. You have to have a childlike faith. You have to have a simple belief that when you accept Jesus, you have a gift. You have an ability to hear your Father's voice. You are, you are now able to distinguish the shepherd's voice. If you don't believe that, you will be at a disadvantage. Doubt will creep in. Fear will creep Are you sure that was God? I'm not sure. Maybe they didn't God. I'm not. But if you say, you know what, I'm just a sheep and I hear from God, you'll be amazed at how in Instead of seeing life as serendipity, you're able to see the sovereignty. You're able to see the small things and you're like, wow, God's speaking to me. You look at a sunset and instead of just seeing the beauty of nature, you see God speaking a picture in a thousand words to your heart. And see, it's in that place when you're able to come alive and hear the shepherd's voice that you're like, Jesus, you speak to me. But yet then Jesus says something I think which is pretty amazing in verse 5. He says, Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but, they will, uh, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. I want to I go through, one, I, I answered that you can hear from God, that you have a gift, but I want to go through distinguishing, or if I can put some spiritual language on it, discerning God's voice. That when you get an idea, you get a thought, you get an impression. How do I know that's God, Pastor? Like I had a dream last night. How, how do I know that's God or was that the bad burrito that he keeps talking about? Like what, what, when is it that God's speaking to me? Or is this just some opportunity? Like I, is that God calling me to marry this person? Am I supposed to take this job? We all wrestle with those questions. We all try to discern, is God speaking to me in this moment? And I think there's some key indicators to help us distinguish God's voice. Distinguish the shepherd's voice from the other voices. And the first point I want you to get on this is a stranger's voice is strange. Okay, yeah. Whew, deep thinking here at Church of the Living God. It's like when my wife, uh, I, I, we, were, we were driving in reverse and I said, Oh, wow, reverse is like driving forwards but backwards. And she's like, Wow, married a winner right there. Like just... <laughs> But I say a stranger's voice is strange, and we think that's simple, but yet, because we listen to so much of the news and the media and Facebook and uh, The Bachelorette and TV shows and movies, we, because we're so uh, in, indoctrinated by the world's way and the world's system, a stranger's voice is actually common to us. And so when the shepherd's voice comes, it seems, that seems strange because we've never really dove in or, or dive, dive whew, my words are just messing up, but you get what I'm saying. We've never pressed in to hearing from God and changing the way we think in such a way that when his voice comes, that's the common voice instead of the strange voice. I love what Romans 12, the second chapter says. It says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why would you want to do that? So that you can prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Notice he says there that the natural flow of life, if you just simply live life, you're going to conform. You're going to think like the world thinks. You're I had somebody already leave and just walk out the service. If that's you, try to do it a little bit more quietly, and I won't call you out. And so, <laughs> we laughing right now. I'm just giving you the anesthesia before I cut. Some of y'all are listening to the red news or the blue news like that's the gospel. And it's developing this self-righteousness in you that's causing you to demonize people that God wants to reach. I said that about as soft as I'm going to say that today. And it's, it's created a deception in you, and you're declaring it as a righteousness, yet it's the, it, what it's doing, it's causing you to look at other side and other people and say, well, they're jacked up. they got to be sinners. They're going to hell because they believe this way or they believe that way or they don't vote this way. And it's because you're listening to the stranger's voice. 
See, you know, what's interesting is the devil doesn't show up and say, I'm the devil. Corinthians says he shows up as an angel of light. He shows up as Fox News or CNN, whichever one you listen to, I don't care. And, and see, what it does is it infiltrates your mind in thinking such a way that you start dividing yourself between people. You start judging people, and, and, and maybe you say, well, I'm judging them by their character. Right? Good. You're Martin Luther King Jr. Don't judge them by the content of their color. Judge them by the content of their character. But the problem, with the, even with that mentality, what if God judged us by our character? Where would we be headed if he looked at where we were jacked up and said, I am done with those people. They don't vote the right way. Let's leave them alone. What if it was about reaching the other side? What if it was about loving people that didn't love you? What if it was about a transformation in your heart? And it's in that place that when you change up here and, and what changing up here looks like, you love people that don't look like you. When you start to do that, it's like God begins to open up his wellspring of words in your heart. Nobody left. Praise God. If you left on Facebook, we still love you. Amen. Amen. But it's in this place like you're like, wow. I, in fact, I'm going to pick on some other people, all my single people up in here today. Like you're watching The Bachelorette, and so you think after three dates you need to sleep with somebody. Right? And, and it's this mentality, well, if I don't sleep with a pastor, they ain't going to want me. Well, what you, you have a core belief system that says somebody's only going to want you for your body. And see, what happens then is you, well, i got to make sure I'm primped up and I'm all good. And you're, you're not even worrying about the heart. And, and so it keeps you in this place of deception. And so i got to sleep around now. And, and, and maybe you're like, well, i got to prove I'm a man. They just can't do that. In front. Like, I got, I'm a man, right? And it's like, you know, you're not even a man. You're a person that's running after your own senses. Like we used to go that way. We used to be subject to the powers of this world. When we got, when we got excited about seeing a girl, we just said, wow, ooh, yeah. I know what I would do with that late, right? Because we were subject to Satan. And we were only after emotion or a feeling. And, and, and here, ooh, I'm preaching too much. And, and here's the problem. Satan ain't counterfeiting $1 bills. Why do you think sex is so perverted in our culture? Why do you think it's so twisted? Why do you think it's, it's all about just a feeling or, or, or being held emotionally and not about covenant and laying down your life and being sacrificial? Why, why has it become something where it's just like, oh, yeah, we've been dating a while. Let's, let's hook up. Let's do that thing. Why has it become that? Because Satan knows if he can twist it, if he can pervert it, then the relationship you have with God, you will place in that same place. So it's important that you're transforming. That when you see the bachelorette and they just start sleeping, you're like, we can't watch this anymore. Like Game of Thrones is not on the menu anymore. Like I got to, we just going to be watching VeggieTales. Like, I think The Chosen's a good series if you want to watch something. But you're like, man, I got to be different. I got to transform this mind. It's like a, um, there was a contractor, he had hired a young apprentice, and they had to cut some two-by-fours. They were eight foot, they needed to cut them to seven foot, six inches. And he said, hey, apprentice, I think you could do this. You just, you measure it to seven, six, just cut it off. It's super easy. You can do this. He's like, I could do this. I got it, I got it, I got it. So he measures off the first one, gets it seven, six, cuts it perfect, gets a straight uh, speed square out, and marks it off. He's like, boom, got it. Bam. He's like, let me, oh, I can do this faster. How about I grab the board, and I just place it on top of the next one and cut it off and he's like boom got it and then he just instead of grabbing the same board he grabs a new board clip, cut it boom boom he goes through all 2000 and when the contractor gets back he says what if you do these are all cut different sizes and he says yeah but I, I did it this method he said you didn't you didn't use the measuring tape and see here's the thing many of us we're grabbing the new revelation. We're grabbing the new philosophies of this world. We're grabbing what sounds good to our ears instead of going back to the revelation of Jesus never changing. The word, the Bible that... that it penetrates in our heart in such a way that when we're called to measure things in life, when we're called to make decisions, we go to that word for the answer. 
Like if you're in a business today, I love the book of Proverbs where it talks about having integrity and, and walking in, in justice, not having false weights. And yet you have this idea. You're like, oh, there's this thought that came to me. I could do this. It's a little gray, Lord. I know I got forgiveness. There's grace there. A little gray, but I could get some more prosperity in it. There'd be blessing. And yet that word it comes to you and says, you know what? I don't want you to do that. I want you to, I want you to promise and swear to your own hurt, even if it costs you a little bit. Walk in integrity before me. And see, that word will come to you. It'll be spoken to you in such a way that it causes you to transform. Got some amens from the people of God here today? Amen. And, and, it's, and it's beautiful that as you're in this place, that when the word is spoken to you, it's going to cultivate faith and not conjure up fear. That's the second point for those that take notes, which is like nobody, I don't think. Anyway, it's not true. That's not true because I see some of y'all, y- y'all come up to me after and you're like, you had four points, Pastor, and you only gave me three. And I'm like, okay, well, I didn't, yeah, I didn't say the last point. I just forgot. So <laughs> second point, when God speaks to you, it's going to cultivate faith, not conjure up fear. Let me say it in a different way. You're going to be brought to uh, an obstacle. And instead of you seeing it as an obstacle, you're going to see it as an opportunity. Yes. And sometimes it's going to be in a place where your past voices won't be the loudest voice. I, I love when the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and says, you mighty man of valor. That was the word of the Lord to him. And what did he say? Well, you got the wrong dude. I don't know what, like how you're at. But I'm the, I'm the least of the least. I, I'm like a nobody in my clan. Like there's no way that God could use me. See, the voice of the Lord came to him and because he had been living in his past, living with uh, uh, other voices, he could not hear when God showed up. And, and some of us go off with that same reason. We're like, there's no way I can have a great marriage. Like it's just, it's a struggle. I can't believe it. My grandfather had been married four times. My dad was a womanizer. Like I'm just going to struggle. And you get into this struggle with your spouse and you're like, Lord, I don't know, man. I just, I'm guess I'm always going to fail. And the Lord's like, just forgive them. And you're like, wait, 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 Lord, it's their turn to forgive. Oh, y'all don't work on the turn system with your spouse. So, uh, and the Lord's like, no, 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 you can forgive. You're like, Lord, it's my third time to forgive them. And then that word comes to you. And it's like, oh yeah, Peter asked that same question. What was my answer? Seven times 70 in a day. And it's like just mercy starts to flood your heart. And there's a, there's a change. There's, there's a cultivation of faith, not a conjuring of fear. You don't, you're not looking at yourself at your past failures or the struggles of where you grew up. You're looking at yourself of where God is going to take you. When you start to live this way, you don't see a giant in the land. You see it as an opportunity. Remember like when Goliath's in the land for 40 days and 40 nights? Y'all okay? Y'all still coming with me a little bit? Like, and if you're not, just act like you're nodding your head while you're... Shh. Like, like there's a giant in the land, and for 40 days he's calling out the people of Israel. Where's your God? This blankety-blank God, like, like he's nobody. And they didn't see it as an opportunity. They saw him as an obstacle. But see, David, who had spent time with the Lord... Like he knew how to get on his face before the Lord. He knew about the quiet times. He knew about the secret place. When he saw Goliath, he saw it as an opportunity. And my friends, here's the beautiful thing about life. That when you start spending time and reading that Bible and diving into the Bible, you're going to face challenges in this life and you're going to get excited about them. You're going to be like, yes, Lord, this is an opportunity for me to overcome. And why is that? I love what what Timothy would say when Paul writes to Timothy. In 2 Timothy, he says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. Can somebody say power? Power. Come on, we're going to get the power team out here today. It's for all my church people. Anyway, but the power and of love and of a sound, that word sound mind is, if I could put it in our language, it's thinking like heaven thinks. You come to a situation and you don't reason like the world reasons. You're full of the Spirit of God, and you're like, oh, that's how God would answer that. Um, so I can wake us all up. It's, it's like when God spoke to me, and he started having me pick up hitchhikers. Now, I grew up with a wisdom that said, you don't pick, pick up hitchhikers, because they could be axe murderers, right? Like, we all know Alfred Hitchcock. Like, you're not picking up. That's for my baby boomers, just so y'all can laugh. And so, like, you're not, you're not, you're not like, picking up 
hitchhiked. That's crazy. And I remember God had me a season where I was like picking. And I remember one of the nights I came out, of, I think it was Chili's. Uh, our young adults go to IHOP. We were coming out of Chili's or something. It was late. And there was this guy came up to me. He didn't have a shirt on. He's like, I need a ride. And everything in my mind is like, this dude needs more than a ride right now. Like, <laughs> and he gets up closer to me, and he's like, you could smell the alcohol on his breath. It's like he's drinking all vodka. I don't know what's going on. I was like, that's not the aroma of the Lord right now. Can we just have some space here? And, and I'm thinking, this is probably not a good idea. But yet, I'm in the season. Let's pick up this hitchhiker. Let's, and I had a Mazda Miata. I don't know if you know about those cars. That's like, that's like hands-on ministry when you get in that car. And so... When I get to take him where he's going, uh, every, every thought in me in this moment is fear. This guy probably has a knife in his pocket. He's about to jack you. Like, this is crazy, Trey. Even your mama said don't pick up hitchhikers. Like, you, did you just fall off the loony? Like, all of these thoughts of fear are racing through me. Now, I have, I have an opportunity. Am I going to conjure up fear, or am I going to listen to the voice of faith? And I said, no, the Lord's called me to pick up him. And so I began to just, God, what do you want to say to him in this moment? I just said, do you know Jesus, man? I felt like he told me to pick you up. And he's like, what? Like, maybe I'm not the crazy one. Like, he's like, <laughs> and, and so I, I pick him up. I, I, as I begin to tell him about Jesus, the Lord begins to just drop more stuff in my spirit. Because see, once you start to walk in faith, the floodgates of heaven begin to open up. And he's like, tell him he's called to preach. And I'm like, uh, he don't look like he's called to preach, Jesus. Like, <laughs> content of his character is not preacher material right now. But I hear heaven, and I'm just like, dude, I feel like you're called to preach. And he's like, and when I said that, it's like it just, it was a key that unlocked his heart, and tears began to roll down his face. And he's like, my grandma told me that. Like, she's been praying for me. And I said, I got to pray, Mama. I know what you're going through right now. And it was beautiful in this moment. And, it, and, and like, woo, it got exciting. I began to just declare more stuff over him. And we were supposed to go further down the road. But he's like, can we just pull over to this gas station? You're a little too strange for me. <laughs> and who knows? Maybe, maybe he planned on jacking me. But what overcomes darkness? And see, the problem is a lot of us, we're scared of the darkness because we don't have bright light. And you say, but pastor, come on, be, use wisdom, brother. Be reasonable. <laughs> so the funny part is, I'm going to watch this later, and I'm going to look at my faces and say, yeah, that was kind of weird. Don't do that again. So, <laughs> third way to, to understand that you're hearing distinguished discern that you're hearing from God's voice is that there will be a heavenly wisdom to it. Yes. Heavenly wisdom. I love this. One of my favorite verses comes out of John, uh, James the third chapter. James the third chapter, the 13th verse says this, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness, or you could say humility, of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly. Now, when he uses that word sensual, it doesn't necessarily mean sexual there. It means a person that is sense-driven. Meaning you say, well, I'm feeling like doing this, so I'm going to do that. My emotions are leading me this way. This is what I can see. That's, that's what I'm going to do. So you're, you're driven by your emotion. You're driven by what you can see. They're sensual Boom, James, I thought I was preaching hard stuff this morning. You said that they think like a demon. Uh, use reason, brother. Demon thinking. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Whew, that is good. Like, we could just go amen on that. James is preaching, brother. When I see you in heaven, I'll be like, to take up an offering. That was good. So, <laughs> preacher joke. So, like, we, we see that there's a type of wisdom. You've got to, like, really think about that. James calls this type of thinking a wisdom. He doesn't say it's deception, it's foolishness, it's idiotic. 
He says it's wisdom. Why does he use that language? Because there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end will lead in destruction. So there's something that, that perceived right to you. There's a way to live like that. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go that way. But the underlying logic, the underlying reason is full of self-seeking and envy. It's full of self-preservation. It's full of, uh, uh, full of taking care of myself. It's full of, you got that? Well, I want that now. And we all church people today, so I say envy and self-seeking. You're like, that ain't me. Let's go on, right? So let me use some different language here. It's when you compare and complain. Whew. There's some people in the church on that one. And see, when you fall into comparison and complaining, what's happened is you have an underlying thinking, you have an underlying reasoning that's going to lead you away from the will of God, away from hearing the voice of God, instead of following after Him. What do I, what do I mean by complaining? Uh, um, I love it. I was in the military and we wore camouflage. And the reason we wore camouflage is we didn't want the enemy to see you, Right? Well, see, here's the thing. When you complain, you're taking off the camouflage of love, the thing that God has designed to hide you in the secret place. And what you're telling the enemy, you're saying life is about me. And see, with that attitude, if you say life is about me, Satan will do everything he can to make sure he has a field day of every evil work in your life. And you're like, why am I going through all this? Because you complaining in line at Walmart. Because you complain. I don't want to pick on you guys. Let me pick on myself. There was a season in my life where I would come to sermons and I said, I already heard that. I already know that. And it was this attitude of, what's this preacher got? And the problem with that attitude is faith doesn't come by having heard the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing. There's an active, present Tense. There's a humility in your heart that every time you open the scriptures, every time you listen to the word preach, you are in a place of God, I need to hear from you. And even if their doctrine's a little crazy or maybe not like I think it should be, I know that you will speak to me if I humble myself. Yeah. And see, when I put myself in that position... What I found is there was a wellspring of God's words that came alive to me. When I felt like, you know, I was dead, I was struggling, I was like, God, when are you going to speak? Why do I have this place where I can't hear right now? It's because I had blocked God because I thought life was about me. And see, you can even wrap religious language around it. You can say life's all about His provision and His protection, but if you do not le learn the road of sacrifice, if you do not learn the road of denying yourself, what will happen is you'll think you hear God's words, but it's an earthly wisdom. It's a lot of words. I don't even know why I'm trying to preach fast. I don't, it's not like I'm going to another service after this. Let's just slow down a little bit. Just slow down. Let me talk about uh, comparing and how that's a dangerous trap. You know, Paul says you compare each other among each other, and that is not wise. I know from my own life, uh, I got here in 2010 to pastor. There was another pastor that came about the same time. We're about the same age. I'm not talking about Robert Lee right now, just so we're all on the same page. <laughs> About the same age, uh, I'm a little bit better looking, but, uh, oh wait, we're not supposed to be comparing. Sorry, sorry, I messed up, I messed up. Denzel, cut that out on Facebook. Anyway, so, uh, but, but as I was doing ministry, again, I felt like God had called me down here. I felt like he was going to do awesome things. I'm like, yeah, Jesus. But as I was pastoring, nothing happened. We were struggling. Like, just to, y'all know my story. I'm counting pregnant women twice, because like, one, we do count life in the womb, right? Come on, amen. But, but I'm like, that's two. And if they were a little bit bigger, look like twins. That's three right there. Count that on the rolls. And uh, amen. Come on, man. Just prophesy. And so, um, but nothing's happening. Nothing's growing. And I see this other minister who started about the same time, and his ministry's blowing up. He's like taking Easter pictures. And I'm like, 
dude, what is that? Like the Reliance Stadium? Like that's huge. And, and I started to struggle. I'm like, God, why aren't you blessing me like you're blessing him? Like, like his stuff's going on. My stuff ain't working. Like, God, what's going on? And, and I started to get jealous. I started to be envious. And, you know, I wasn't telling nobody. This is just me and my alone time with the God. But there was, there was this struggle here. And I was like, oh, why? God bless me. Do for me. And, and one of the times I was up in the morning, I was just praying, seeking the Lord. And the Lord came to me with a word. And he said, you're jealous. I said, huh? He said, you're jealous of that man's ministry. And I said, Lord, I ain't jealous. Like, you're going to argue with the Lord. Like, that's going anywhere. I said, Lord, this, this is in my heart, right? Like, what do I do? And, and, and it's good to get real with the Lord. Be honest. But it's also good not to stay in that place, too. A lot of y'all get real with the Lord, but you stay there. You're like, I'm just being real with the Lord, right? Like, no, he wants you to change. And he spoke to me. He said, you know what I want you to do? I want you to start writing a check to his ministry every month. Amen. Above your tithes, above your offerings, I want you to write him a check. And I said, Lord, what are you his ministry is bigger than mine. Tell him to write me a check, right? <laughs> Earthly reasoning, right? And, and I said, okay, Lord, I'll be obedient. And I wrote that check. And, and what was beautiful is as I wrote that check and I mailed it every month, the Lord began to change my heart. See, he could never unlock the promises for me because had he done what he has wanted to do in my ministry, I wouldn't have been ready for it. I thought it would have been all about me or my gift or my abilities and not his grace. But see, when I was able to get outside of myself and walk in his reasoning, it, it's beautiful how, I love this, if you continue reading in verse 17, all of these things started to pop up in my life. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable and gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy. So I stopped trying to be right with my wife all the time. I was like, you know what? I'm the head, but you the neck. Move us around. Like, get us going. Amen? Amen. Sorry. Sorry. That's a, my, my Greek wedding joke. So anyway. And good fruits. Without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. As I did it every month, I would declare to God, I'd say, God, this is my fruit of righteousness that I'm not jealous. I know you're changing my heart. I know you're changing how I think. Let me not be in competition with other people. Let me walk with you. It, in fact, I heard the Lord saying this for this message. He said, tell my church that I'm not looking for a trophy wife. Yet, yet us as pastors, we're always like trying to compare each other by size and numbers. and things. That's, that's, like, that's like a husband seeking after a wife for her outward beauty. But we know that beauty fades and favor is deceitful. But a woman that fears the Lord shall be praised all her days. You see, there came a place in my heart where I stopped trying to achieve and I started trying to just become like Jesus. And there was a peace in my heart. You know, it, it was beautiful. When, when God started to change my heart, nothing actually changed on the outside. Nothing changed as far as the ministry. Nothing. It was all by faith. But yet there was a peace that passeth understanding. And see, when you walk this way, when you start to say, you know what, I need to change so that I can hear God, you start to walk in all the things He's promised for your life. And I... My friends, it is exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. But you got to learn how to tap in. you got to learn how to distinguish the shepherd's voice from the stranger's voice. Can we all bow our heads together today? Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I never like to close a service without giving you an opportunity to know Jesus. I talked about that movie Ratatouille and, and how the rat had a gift. You have the opportunity to have a gift. That gift is salvation through Jesus Christ. See, we don't deserve God. We don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve His rightness. But yet God saw fit that in our weakness, in our insecurity, in our failure, 
that he was willing to send his son because he loved us. And I don't know what religion's taught you. I, I know what I hear sometimes, that God's out to get you, that he's here to punish you, that you better get everything right. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that when we were sinners, when we were an enemy to God, that God demonstrates his love by sending Jesus to die for us. And those that accept this gift, those that accept this freedom, are, are, are liberated from sin, liberated from self, liberated from Satan. And it's simply a yes today. He's not asking you to change. He's not asking you to clean up. My friends, we're Galvestonians. We know we can't clean a fish till we catch it. And until you say yes to Jesus, when you say yes, then he'll start working on you. But too often we're saying, well, I got I to gotta do this. Then I can get ready. And God's saying, just simply come and let me clean your house. If that's you today, you want to say yes to God. You want to accept Him. You're, you're tired of living for yourself. You want to follow after Jesus. You want to be able to hear His voice for your life. Or, or maybe you've said a prayer at some point, but you're not living right. I know for my own life, I'm, I'm the grandson of a pastor. I made a commitment to the Lord at a young age, but through disappointments, I had walked away from God. And in 2001, through much prayer from my mama, many invites to church from my daddy, Ooh, thank you for my daddy, God. I came back to church and I rededicated my life to God. And if that's you today, you say, you know what, I want to say yes to Jesus for a first time, or you want to rededicate your life. You're tired of living for self. You want to follow after Jesus. If that's you, you want new beginnings, just raise your hand high in there. I want to pray with you. Amen. Come on. Anybody else? Yeah, so good. He's for you. Amen. Anybody else? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today is the day of salvation. He's as close as the breath on your lips and the belief in your heart. Father, you see all those hands that were raised towards you. You said that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so Jesus, we call upon you today. We ask you to just cleanse us of all of our sins. Make us brand new on the inside. Change us in such a way that we don't go back, that we follow the voice of the shepherd. And Jesus, your, your blood shed for us. And you also rose again on the third day. And you're seated at the right hand of the Father. So God, you're more than a God now. You're our dad. We say happy Father's Day to you. Teach us and guide us. Be a good father. Not like an earthly father. You're a good father who gives good gifts to your children. Show us what you show us what it is. Your character is a good father. Holy Spirit, fill us right now. Everyone that raised their hands, I ask that they be filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit right now. In Jesus' name I pray. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 If you prayed that simple prayer with me, you are brand new in the kingdom of God. It says, old things have passed away, all things are new. I want to give you two words today. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're in the family of God. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> we all stand to our feet together today.